My name is Monk Rowe. I'm at St. Peter's Church inside the chapel with Mr. Jimmy Heath, composer and arranger, jazz master. I want to congratulate you on your career. Thank you very much, uh, Monk. And your, uh, your new book. Thank you. You, Again. you, you said some, some really neat things. I actually thought I invented a word and I saw you use it in your book called Melodize. Melodize. You said you melodized and you wrote the melodies of the beat of life. Yeah, well, melodize. I've heard that word before okay. from others. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where it came from, but yeah. it floats around it here. Does. So all, anybody can use it, as you said you did. Yeah. Do you think your composing changed over the years from when you started writing in the late 40s until now because of the life? Well, you know, I think I've gotten better at uh, everything because I practice all the time and I'm writing all the time. And I think the uh, Macintosh Apple computer helped me to do a lot of uh, editing and to present my music pretty much like I want it before I take it to the people with the breath of life and then it comes to really fruition. Are you a finale user? Yes. Yes, so am I. Yeah. And it's interesting, you can, you can almost get used to the way it sounds coming out of the computer and then when you put it in front of people it's like, yeah. oh, there's that missing. It comes, it comes to life. Element. Yeah. I was really happy to see um, you talk about your relationship with the Adderleys, which was a uh, cannonball was a like a musical hero of mine. Mm -hmm. What was it about him that? Well, I consider Cannonball Adderley as a country preacher in his uh, deliverance of his uh, melodic performances. Mm -hmm. You know, he had the, the South in his playing as well as the science. And people who have that, they got the whole thing, as far as I'm concerned. Coltrane had it. My brother Percy had it. He was born in North Carolina, and I was born in Philadelphia. And Percy could play the blues uh, after leaving the MJQ. And uh, playing with the Heath brother, he started to play what I call the baby bass, which was uh, something that Ray Brown created it was a cello body strung up like a bass. Mm. And Percy could play the blues and get over every time because he's born in North Carolina in the South. There's something about being born in the South. At that time, of course, people are born everywhere now and can play the blues. <laughs> you said something that uh, just in what you said about the blues makes me wonder, you were talking about how jazz is sometimes now thought of as the white man's music. And what is the reason for that? I didn't say it was a white man's music. I said the white man is claiming it mm, okay. for his music, but it was created by African Americans. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were a few whites even at that time, you know, big spider back in people back then. They were in that same mode, but the majority of the performers were African Americans. Now the world, there are people, you know, I've been all over and I, I hear people playing like Sonny Rollins or Coltrane or Dizzy or whoever from here, coming from all over the world. Mm -hmm. They've heard that music and they've absorbed some of those, uh, some of the, the improvisational language. You consider yourself, uh, you grew up in the bebop era. Yeah. Yeah. And but you've I, heard. I also grew up in the swing era. Right. So where does your heart still lay? Well, I think uh, I still love the fact that even bebop swung. I still like a pulse in my music, and I'm not a meter maid. 
I'm not changing meters from nine, eight, and this and that, and all five, four, and this, seven, all these meters. I, you know, I walk in four, four, and I live in four, four. And I think all of those meters can be applied to four, four. So that you, you could write a seven, eight figure, but still stick in four. Yeah. Yeah. It okay. would just hang over the ball line. Right, That's right. All. You know, I was uh, interested in one passage where you were writing, I think it was 1949, mm -hmm. and you were on the same bill as the Orioles. Mm -hmm. And you saw mm -hmm. the, the beginning of R&B, rock and roll, Motown, all that stuff. And I wonder if you and your fellow musicians saw something coming that was worrisome. No, I didn't see anything that worry, was worrisome because we had different genres mm -hmm. and we still have different genres of music. So I didn't have a problem with people, uh, quartets singing, Oreo singing, songs, what are you doing, New Year's, or whatever the song, that was the one that was popular. But I was with Dizzy's band in, the, in the Apollo. When the Oreos had that, they were the headliners. And Dizzy's band was not. We were on the program with them. So, you know, uh, there's still different genres. And uh, what they call R&B, rock and roll, whatever, they all have uh, some close, some, they borrow some things from the jazz idiom, too. Mm -hmm. Did you ever look upon guys like uh, Sam the Man Taylor mm -hmm. and King Curtis mm -hmm. and wonder, I wonder if I should try to be doing, get into that studio business and well, no, I played behind uh, King uh, Curtis in Philadelphia. See, I had a student mm -hmm. by the name of Sam Reed who ran the band at the Uptown Theater in Philadelphia where all the R&B shows were held. So I played behind. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the one that played the guitar and the tenor. Not, not Sam, uh, the man Taylor, he was with I think he was one of the big bands. He came out. I think he was too. I I'm think talking about the other guy. What's his? He got killed. Oh, King Curtis. King Curtis. King Curtis. Yeah. Yeah, he got killed up in yeah. Harlem. Yeah. What were the that you know I, I was. Since the '80s and so forth, you have garnered, some wonderful awards, some commissions, honorary degrees. Mm -hmm. Do you sometimes think I could have used some of that in the 1960s? Well, you know, you uh, as far as I, I feel that I'm very fortunate uh, to have uh, made a living off of playing what I like. Not a, not a lot of people can say that. You have to compromise, and I have at. Uh, at one point, when we were with Columbia Records, mm -hmm. we compromised and added some things to, to sell more product. But uh, basically, I would say I've been very fortunate to have played the music I loved mm -hmm. all my life and made a good living. And written some lasting compositions, too. I think so. Yeah. I hope so. Do you get, you know, when uh, Let's say a Jimmy Heath song used to, let's say it showed up in the real book. Mm -hmm. Did you ever used to get any compensation for that? Not for those gangsters who made those books. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as, <coughs> excuse me, as far as uh, the legitimate books, you know, I get uh, Jamie Ava song or somebody like that. Yeah. Or the guy in California who put three or four of my songs in his book. I can't think of his name now. He makes, he makes uh, 
big books about songs okay. from the jazz yeah. world. Right, and the, the real book has now been, I think, made, well, le made legal, sort of. Yeah, well, that, the, the, who's the publisher? A share. I yeah, think, yeah, I get money from him. Yeah, oh good. For my songs. Uh -huh. uh, and da or Danny Share? Or is it no? I'm not sure what his first name is. Okay. Yeah. Share music. When you go to the mail every day, this is sort of a personal question, but what kind of income might you receive that could be a surprise to you from things you've done? <coughs> well, I think um, the biggest surprise was when I was sampled by a uh, rapper by the name of Nas, whose father, Olu Dara, was a trumpet player. And oh. Nas sampled me, and you know, I got big checks from, from his uh, uh, composition that he calls One Love. Mm -hmm. But all he used was a few bars. Neat. Of your tenor playing? No. Just of uh, the composition. I see. It was on a, uh, a suite that I wrote for Billy Higgins called Smiling Billy Sweet. And one part had the Stanley Cow playing the kalimba, the African thumb piano, and my brother Percy playing the bass. And uh, that composition was the one that was sampled the most. Very interesting. I want to talk about uh, jazz education a little bit. Um, you had said that Playing with too much technique or showing off won't usually speak to a lot of people. And I wonder if that's not what a lot of jazz educators teach young musicians to do, is to play with a lot of technique. Well, they have to have some technique, mm -hmm. but they go overboard sometimes with that, you know. And, uh, you know, I th my opinion about improvisational music is to have science and soul, those two elements. If you got those two elements equally okay. But if you're overboard with one, with the science, you got too much science and not enough feeling, it doesn't work. Because the average person hasn't studied all the sequences and all the things that you are playing, mm -hmm. they don't know what that is. You know, they think you're practicing, yeah. <laughs> which you are, instead of standing there and improvising. And you have to have a feeling to do that. And that's the soul part, which is a natural ability to try to lyricize what you're playing sing to the people. The greatest improvisers of all time knew how to do that. Johnny Hodges didn't have a problem going around scientists or laymen and getting over because he sang. He made the saxophone sing. Uh, ben Webster didn't have a problem with that, you know. And then some of the masters, well, other than those two, like Coltrane, I heard him play ballads. I knew when Train could play ballads and touch people, you know. Sonny Rollins has such a rhythmic feel to his playing that he never had a problem getting over. Mm -hmm. So those elements, the rhythmic feel, the soulful feeling, the art of singing through your instrument, telling the story. Lester Young used to say, you got it. What is your story, Prez? You have to have a story. So you're telling the, the audience your story musically. And your story is not high tech science. That's not the story they can understand. That may be your story. But you, you, you minimize your audience. The, you know, it, like... Uh, if you like Gene Ammons, mm -hmm. Gene Ammons could play anywhere. 
and people loved him because he could he could sing with the horn. And there are a lot of uh, musicians who are like that. How do you tell a 18-year-old college freshman how to put more soul? Because I've got this problem where I teach, maybe I can well, get a word. Well, they listen to, they're listening, <clears throat> and they listen to too much soul sometimes. <laughs> you know, people who don't really play with a lot of science. The popular ones, Kenny G. They listen to that. Boney James. They listen to that. And they know that those people can get over. So they give up their, what they want to do, their expression, to please an audience. That's a different thing. If you can keep your idea of what music should be like and still get over, that's when you reach a, a very happy compromise with an audience. Wow. And ballads are very important, love songs, because everybody wants to make love. Well said. I've had a debate sometimes with musicians about are there wrong notes when you improvise? Well, the way I look at improvisation, you know, you can step out of the basic chord pattern if you make the connections. In, in other words, life is about connections. Everything musically is about connections. Socially is about connect. Connections is one of the biggest words in the English language. You've got to make a connection. And that's what I'm talking about. If they, you know, if you see, like, uh, I remember uh, Theodore Fats and Navarro, great trumpeter. And Fats used to play, if a woman walked in with a red dress on, he played a lady in red because he's trying to pull this broad or something. You know what I mean? They trying to, they're trying, he was trying to communicate and connect. And that's what I'm talking about. Your 18 year old has to connect too to his girlfriends. It's not, it has not to do with age, but he has to first have an experience. He hasn't had enough experiences sometimes. He's just, just learning the scientific part of the, of the music. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn something about the emotional part. You've got to feel that. And there's, there's a lot of young people who come up and they got that feeling right away. In other ones, they're going for the science and they don't get it till maybe later. The feeling of humanness, being a human being, to communicate with other human beings. You don't need a Geiger counter to tell what you're playing. Oh, he's playing a, a F sharp minor ninth with a raise. You know? Who cares? <laughs> How did it affect me in my heart, mm -hmm. in my mind, in my body? The three ears. I wrote a piece called Three Ears for the symphony orchestra. And that was a, the premise of that. That the mind has an ear, the body has an ear, and the heart has an ear. That's the three ears. And if you get somebody to hear your music with all those three ears, you're going to be okay. <laughs> oh, that's terrific. I'm, sometimes when I think about the history of jazz, I, it, it, it has moved so fast, it seems like. And I was remembering <coughs> that some of the things that Coltrane and Ornette Coleman did mm -hmm. in the 60s, mm -hmm. and now that seems like, wow, what is that, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. I wonder what your reaction was to records like um, Ascension and Free Jazz? Well, I played Ascension once. 
You played it once. And I don't play it no more. I didn't like Ascension. I like Cole Swain's ballad playing. I like uh, his greatest composition to me is Naima. Mm -hmm. Most beautiful, as, as beautiful as Bach, Beethoven, uh, anybody, Tchaikovsky, anybody. It's one of the greatest melodies ever written. That's what I like. I like to hear him swing on swing tunes. But Ascension sounded like a big band warming up before they went on the stage. Everybody warming up. It's too many voices to hear and distinguish anything. And when I studied with uh, uh, Professor Rudolf Schramm from Leipzig, Germany, and he told me about the, the three different ways or three counterpoint lines. You can't hear but two or three. <laughs> and if everybody's playing like that, it just, it's just, it's too dense. Very dense. I'm curious as to what was the circumstances that you, you played it. Because how much of it was a song? Wasn't there just a bow, dad, a little... I don't know. I, don't, I didn't like that one. I got plenty of Cold Train records I love. Oh, you mean you played the record once? Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, I never played it. how many oh, times no. I played it. I thought you meant you... I played the record yes. once. And okay. Boom, I was done with yeah, it. And even uh, Mingus, yeah, I, I heard he said the same thing. It sounded like everybody in the practice yeah. room warming up to go on the stage. Yeah. There's no distinctive melody there. And what is music? Now we got music that is words and a rhythm mm -hmm. and no melody and no harmony. And how do you feel and about that? And that is not music to me. Mm -hmm. It's music to a lot of kids. They think it's music. Every generation has their, their time. My brother went to his death, Percy. Tomorrow, oh, that ain't gonna last. I say, yes, it is, Percy. Just like I was listening at uh, uh, Glenn Miller on the TV last night, because I heard that when I was a kid. They were trying to get money on PBS. Oh yeah. So they were playing the big band era. Right. So I was hearing, then they played Four Brothers, then they played Lionel Hampton flying home. You know. Because I heard that one like as a kid, so it's going to be with you. You may be educated enough to leave that and go to something else, but you're still going to remember that mm -hmm. because you were raised up with that. So that's what I was telling Percy, man. That, that thing, rap, that's still going. He's been dead since 2005, and that's... It's still here. Yeah, that music, or whatever they call it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the artistic world now, through all the arts, paintings, music, and everything, abscess paintings, abscess music, they call it abstract, I call it abscess. I'm done. And I done stepped on a lot of people's toes, yeah. and I've said enough. <laughs> this is my opinion, this is Monk, and I'm going and warm up for my performance. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I've enjoyed your music, and um, maybe we can do part two someday. And, yeah, I hope You know, so. one, before you go, we're here for okay. Joe Wilder. You have a Joe yeah. Wilder, I mean, I, I consider myself very lucky that I got to play with him a few times and book him oh, some wonder. gigs. I just wonder what your... I had him on, on, a, on a couple of my recordings. Joe Wallace had the, had that, what I was talking about, Johnny Hodges and people like that. He had a gorgeous musical sound. The sound of music, you know, to play? That means a lot to me. And Joe Wilder had a sound that would touch you. He had a great trumpet sound. Mm -hmm. Fasten Navarro was one, Clifford Brown. They had sounds, but Joe Wilder was very special in that 
basic regard. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Heath. All right. <laughs>